thank you all so much. This is going to be a wonderful talk. And uh, let me give you a little bit of background about Listening In, Echoes and Artifacts from Maryland's Mother County, and its author, Meredith Taylor. So Meredith Taylor is Professor Emerita of Theater and Dance at St. Mary's College of Maryland, and she served as chair of the Theater, Film, and Media Studies Department. She was a founding member of the African um, and African Diaspora Studies and Women's Studies programs at St. Mary's College of Maryland, and in her work as a director and choreographer and playwright, she has focused on social justice issues and local history. So she's been a member of the Unified Committee for Afro-American Contributions History Organization since 1996 and has served as president and vice president. She served as project director of St. Mary's County component of the multi-county exhibit, Strive Not to Equal, But to Excel and was a co-editor of UCAC's book, In Relentless Pursuit of an Education, African-American Stories from a Century of Segregation. And that received a 2007 Maryland African-American Heritage Preservation Award. So from 2007 to 2017, she also served as a trustee at Historic Soderley Plantation. Um, and Meredith's been instrumental in helping to get grants and develop new approaches to interpretation there at that historical site. Recording in progress. And in 2009, Meredith wrote, directed, and co-produced the documentary With All Deliberate Speed, One High School Story, which examined the process of desegregation in Great Mills High School in Great Mills, Maryland. And that received the Audience Choice Award in the 2016 Southern Maryland Film Festival. In 2016, she received a Lifetime Service Award from the St. Mary's County branch of the NAACP for her work in arts, education, and history. So her essays and photographs have come out in um, Zocalo Public Square, Burning Word Literary Journal, Southern Maryland This Is Living, and the Delmarva Review. So this book, Listening In, Echoes and Artifacts from Maryland's Mother County, is her book of photographs and stories. This one was published by George F. Thompson in 2018. You can borrow a copy here from your St. Mary's County Library, and we are so pleased to be able to present this work today to you online, but also here in our library art gallery at the Lexington Park branch. So we would love for you to come by and see that work. It will be on display uh, for another couple of weeks. Is that correct, Wednesday? Wonderful. Okay, so we have a couple more weeks on the display that's here at the library. It's amazing to see the photographs all in one space. So thank you so much for being with us today, Meredith, and we're going to go ahead and show some slides from the book and hear some of the stories. Um, thank you, Amy, and uh, I want to start by uh, thanking everyone who came, all my friends and colleagues and everyone else, and uh, thank the library for giving us this opportunity, and we have a great county library system, and also the Arts Council for um, allowing me to put on my exhibit in the uh, gallery at Lexington Park Library. And I hope that people will, uh, will be able to take that in if you haven't seen it. Uh, it's not all about listening in, so there's some other things there as well. And um, also today's very special day, it is Agnes Kane Callum's birthday. And Historic Soderly has made this Agnes Cain Callum Day. So I'm kind of feel honored that my uh, presentation is on the same day. So um, without further ado, this slideshow, I have to say, is um, something that is uh, on the publisher's page. And um, so it's just 10 um, sort of randomly chosen photographs and uh, I am going to read the stories that go with the photographs. It, some of you I know have the book or know the book, um, but it, it, it is displayed one photograph of one story that goes with the photograph. So when you're looking at it and you have the two side by side. So uh, I'm gonna let you look at the photograph while I attempt to read the story. It's getting dark in here, about to rain, but okay. This wonderful building. <laughs> uh, all of the all the stories start with a line of dialogue, and um, and anyway, here goes. 
Come on to the table, everyone. Eat every bit of that up and drink some more water. That'll fill you up. Growing up on a farm by Chesapeake Bay, life was hard, but the family had good times too. They were sharecroppers back then and didn't have much. Sometimes late in the year before the garden was going good, they didn't have much to eat beyond the beans, tomatoes, and pickles the kids helped their mama preserve and the potatoes left in the root cellar. With 13 kids, that didn't go far. A hog or two meant there was always stuffed ham for Christmas. They had the one milk cow and a few chickens, and the oldest boy would take the eggs and milk to town to buy other things they needed, sugar, molasses, coffee, things like that. He and his brothers would go hunting for squirrels and the girls would set traps for possum and coon. Their dad wasn't big on hunting or oystering, but he was a hard worker. Every year when tobacco <clears throat> market time came, He'd ride up to Hughesville with Mr. Ford, the farm owner, and come back with a few hundred dollars. He hadn't gone past the fourth grade in school, and the family was never sure whether that money was truly their fair share. But Mr. Ford ended up selling them a little piece of land with their house on it for a price they could afford. So they figured he was basically a fair-minded man. <clears throat> um, it was hard work. And the family never had money to spend, but they loved each other. They loved being together. And they learned a lot of important lessons about life, about how to stick together and do right by people. Okay, and we'll move on to the next photo, Faye. Thank you. Melbourne Creek Marina. I'm glad the sun's not shining this morning. A perfect day for crabbing is still and not too hot. Standing in the fore of the skiff, Millie flipped and dipped the net, demonstrating for her passenger just how to rake in a running crab. When you catch your own seafood, you appreciate it a little bit more, she'd told her. She told her too how the crabs would reverse fast or know enough to wiggle and stir up the mud when something was after them, how they knew enough to protect themselves that way. Millie'd been crabbing since she was a baby strapped on her mama's back. Her mama would wade through the lush eel grass that grew then all along the shore. Those grasses were mostly gone now and the crabs gone with them. When she was coming along, she and her brother used to go where there was grass out 500 feet and you could see bottom. You could get all the crabs you wanted and the kids sold them for 45 cents a dozen. Not bad money in the 30s. Crabbing wasn't real work then and she still didn't think of it as work. It was good to get out there where it's peaceful and quiet and watch the birds and things. Okay, and the next photograph, please. Thank you. Hmm, how can there be a bug that color? Old Mr. Stanley sat under his garden arbor, laden just then with wisteria and old fashioned roses, and contemplated a bright turquoise colored beetle, the likes of which he had never seen. At least he couldn't remember if he had. It just didn't seem like a color that ought to be in nature. He sat there in the late afternoon sun and marveled at the movement of the beetle's tiny front legs, which seemed to be working the air. But he guessed there must be something there his old eyes couldn't see. He watched it, feeling a momentary kinship, till it wandered off. Or maybe it was his attention that wandered. He just couldn't get over the beauty of this day. Surely, he thought, this must be the most perfect late spring day there ever was, or maybe ever would be for him. And the next photo. Baby girl, you best stop putting every other one in your mouth or you'd be getting a bellyache and wearing out the path to the outhouse. The mother was speaking to the littlest one of the kids sitting around the table peeling the peaches. 
They had gotten two big boxes of bruised fruit that the farmer down in Ridge was getting rid of cheap and a mound of peels and pits was growing in the center of the table. The big black enameled tanner was rumbling and the steam fogged up the mother's glasses as she lifted off the lid and raised the rack. She was glad to have the older girls home to help. Dot was too young to be much use yet. They had a mess of beans to do today too. She was hard on the kids, but that was the way it was when she was coming up. She'd sat right there in that same kitchen doing up tomatoes for days with her mother chiding her to pick up the pace. But just wait till the kids taste those peaches with a thick cream she'd spoon off the milk come January, she thought, smiling to herself. And the next. Tonight's the night. Moon should stay hid, but watch out for agents. A night like this, they're likely to be hiding out in the cove up river listening for motors. Keep it tamped down. The 12 jugs of corn whiskey lined up against the boat shed wall were destined for a ride up river to Washington. What with the government agents prowling the water and beating down the woods hunting for stills, moonshining was risky business. But so far, they've been lucky. They were making close to 1,400 gallons a week worth thousands of dollars in the city. No other way they could make that kind of money, not legal anyway. For some folks, prohibition was just a financial opportunity and the young fellows appreciated a little excitement in their lives. And the next one. Now you see these, when you get the first three leaves off the bottom, that's the shaggy stuff. Don't let that get in with your good tobacco. Keep that to itself. The three sat there together, stripping the tobacco stock, mom and sisters. Dad never stripped but the tips. The women did a fine job. When it came to market, buyers said they always knew whose tobacco it was when it was opened up. It had the reputation of the best in the barn. It was work though, tobacco's hard work, and it's all year work. Crabbing was good for a while, but they couldn't make it with just what he got on the water. Had to get some land and get that money crop in. Seeding, dropping, weeding, picking off worms, cutting, hanging, put it on sticks, push it off and strip it up into bundles, pack it down, bale it and hogs head it up. That was the way it was with tobacco. And the next one, please. Ooh, 30 cents a gallon. Gas prices get any higher. We're going to be sitting here on our butts going nowhere. Frank smiled and tipped the attendant anyway, even as he shook his head. He rolled up the window and put his new DeSoto in gear. In a funny kind of way, being able to complain about it, but still be able to afford it, put him in a good mood. He was on his way up, he thought, as he pulled out and joined the flow of traffic. He flipped on the radio and sang along with the drifters. Money, honey, if you want to get along with me. Now that was a top hit he could really relate to. And the uh, next one. <clears throat> it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Humming along with someone who was feeling it made the time go faster. Shooting the breeze, sharing recipes, that helped too. The crab pickers were mostly women. The shockers mostly men, except for a few like Thelma. She liked working with her hands and she was fast. Speed was what made a star shucker. When she first started shucking, she got some good hints from Button Smith. 
daughter, you got to slip the knife down the bottom shell under the oyster. The way you're going at it, you're cutting right into it, all that liquor running right out. Thelma got it down in no time. Knife under, a twist of her wrist, and that was it. And the next one, thank you. Jack Sprat could eat no fat, his wife could eat no lean. The first time he remembered her chanting the rhyme was when he had insisted on trying to carry her across the threshold the day they came home from the honeymoon. She outweighed him by almost 60 pounds and the attempt was doomed to failure. They stumbled through the door and fell to the floor, laughing almost hysterically as she gasped out the nursery rhyme, Jack Spratt. <laughs> she stayed heavy and robust over the years. He stayed slim in spite of eating her delicious pies and cakes and stuffed ham, though he did develop a bit of a paunch as his hair began to gray. More to love, she'd say. And of course he had to agree with her. When the cancer struck, the weight seemed to fall away from her by the day until her body barely seemed to make an impression in the bed. When at last they carried her out the door, she was light as a feather and Jack couldn't help but feel the bitter irony of it. And the final one. Don Henry, hush up, boy. Give it a rest. Them foxes don't need you barking along with them. The dog gave a couple more woofs as he circled and settled down again. The man was tired from his dawn to dusk work in the tobacco fields and needed rest. He heated up some squirrel stew on the gas burner, giving the dog a portion and finished the rest. He sat at the small table for a little while, studying a scrap of newspaper in the light of his lantern. His eyes roamed the page. A news brief suggested, tired of wisteria, try the kudzu vine. He moved on to a story about a shooting and an account of a bus boycott going down, down in Alabama. He shook his head over an ad telling him he could rent a new Pontiac for $300 down and $18 a week. <laughs> Wouldn't he just like to have that kind of money? He turned down the lantern wick, blew it out, patted the dog on the head, and rolled onto his cot. Thank you. And that is the slideshow. Thank you so much for getting us started with some of these stories and photographs. And uh, what we want to do is open it up to the audience for for questions, for comments. Please feel free to put them in the chat. Please raise your hand. We'll call on you if you're interested. And while you're while you're thinking, I've got a couple of questions that we can kind of get started with. And I think we all want to know, Meredith, what was the genesis for this book? What brought you to tell some of these stories and document some of these places. Okay, um, good, happy to talk about it. It really started with the photographs. Um, I, we moved here in 1990, um, we being Bob Lewis, my uh, spouse and me. And um, when I came here to teach at St. Mary's College and getting to know the county of the best and the most fun way to do it was driving around all the little roads, all the back roads. And uh, I was just amazed at how many abandoned um, dwellings there were. And um, learn, as I learned about the history also from other sources, uh, I was really taken with, with the way that um, so many of the buildings were interesting uh, owner built homes and um, vernacular architecture. And also uh, they, were, they had so much character. And then also the, the way that the nature, that nature was overtaking the abandoned houses, the interaction 
of, of um, the nature of, of the land and the uh, flora and fauna, the flora basically um, taking over. I'm sure there was some fauna in there too, <laughs> but the flora taking over. And uh, and I'm, I thought this is unusual to see so many abandoned houses. And I've found that uh, St. Mary's County is, I think, unusual in that. Of course, a lot of the, the photos that I have of the houses, those houses are no longer um, standing. But um, uh, I, there are a couple of reasons that I think there are many more here. And one of them is that a lot of people, they, it's, it's the sort of the ancestral home and they don't have the money. They want, they have plans to, to salvage these houses. They want to save them, but they don't have the funding to do it often. And so they're waiting and they're planning. And oftentimes as they're doing that, the place is, is falling down. And also the real estate didn't have the kind of commercial value and uh, that a lot of places it does. So the land can just sit there. Um, but anyway, I was very taken with the houses and I thought a lot of them had a sort of um, a beauty. And I know that there is such a thing as ruin porn and I hope that's not what my, <laughs> my photos are. But, um, you know, it, it is interesting watching that process and maybe I relate to it more too as I age, thinking about these, these places aging and, and time changing. And I think that the county has a very interesting history and um, that I, as I learned more and more about the history, I became more interested in the buildings and I mean, they work together. Um, but anyway, so I've been collecting the photographs over a period of, of over 20 years. And, um, and then I got the chance to retire and <laughs> which is, absolutely the most wonderful privilege in the world. And um, I had time to do something creative other than my job, which was also creative and wonderful. And uh, so I just started thinking about, I'd always been curious about who lived in those houses. And um, I guess that started in a way with being curious about looking into houses and wondering even as a child, you know, I always think about walking, and this is rambling, but walking down the street on a early uh, winter evening and the lights would already be on in houses. And I think a lot of people may have done this. And you look into these houses and you just wonder, what is what is their life like? What is that family like? How is it different than mine? But anyway, so I was always curious. And, um, and I thought, I was curious about who lived in those houses that I had photos of. And I thought if I were standing outside that house and um, just as, as the, there was a um, architecture that still existed, what if there was sound that still was floating around kind of echoing in the house, just snatches of conversations that had happened in that place. And so as I imagined who might've lived there, and what kind of conversations they may have had. I started to think of little scenes, little um, stories of moments in their lives, kind of like snapshots or, or scenes. And that's how I began to write the story. So it really came from the, the photographs. Um, so that's a kind of a long answer, but I uh, started with the photos and over a period of years and then I started writing the stories and um, was able to uh, get it published by George Thompson, publisher. And actually, I think there are a couple of people here who were readers and helped me tremendously. So thank you to all of you who helped and Alma who, who helped, who went with me on some of those drives and helped uh, find these buildings. And uh, so it was, it was really fun. That was the genesis. <laughs> so, it, so a community project, really, um, that, yeah, that you were able to bring together. That's amazing. Yeah, and um, a lot of it was based on, on oral histories, I think. The, um, I, when I first uh, came to St. Mary's College, Andrea Hammer had a wonderful uh, cultural journalism program. And the fruits of that 
uh, ended up as Slackwater uh, Oral History Collection, which I think uh, that a lot of people know about. But um, she had a class in cultural journalism, and I got involved in that. And my first play um, was uh, that that I had written was based on on the work uh, that was collected here, and that turned me on to the to the joy and riches of oral history. And then I was able to to work over the years, many years now, with Unified Committee for Afro American Contributions, and we have done I think over a hundred possibly oral histories at this point, and contributed a lot of them to Slackwater and to the libraries. And um, so I learned a tremendous amount. So a lot of my stories really come right out of those oral histories. And the stories, you know, they are fictional, but of course they are based um, on a lot of very real experiences that people had and real events. But um, it would have been wonderful if I knew the actual history of every house of all the people that had lived there. But that was unfortunately not possible. So I was left to utilize my imagination. Exactly. Well, and, and um, uh, Angela said that, you know, she really enjoyed the book and imagining some of those stories. And, um, you know, there are there are maybe folks um, still, I know some who have used outhouses. Um, that's, you know, that's something that was prevalent in this area. Um, and then this, she said the straightening comb and the curling irons bring back memories, too. Um, so everyday items have that kind of history to them. Um, and they, they may not they may not be huge historical events, but that's those everyday things that we remember. Um, and so there was a question too about are there any places that you took a photograph of which now are lost? Um, there are many. You mentioned a few, but are there any additional ones? Um, there there are a lot of there are a number of them that are gone now. And then also, it would have been interesting to be able to do something with the progression because some of them I've continued to take photographs. And so I have them in every stage of demise. Um, but there are many that are gone now. And um, yeah, I, I reckon I always, I, I still recognize the spot. So they're still special to me. So every time I go past that spot, I, I see what used to be there. Yeah, it's a, that kind of ghostly memory. Um, and it's another question was, um, coming up with the stories, did you always go with your first idea of the possible conversation? Did it strike like one kind of story or each each oh. photograph or, um, or did you have multiple stories that might have gone with different uh, places? That's interesting. Yeah, I, th I think I did have different, um, different ideas. Also, a lot of times uh, I would just start writing with one idea and <laughs> by the end of the story, it, it would have changed. I mean, it's the, the actual, I find that with the actual writing, I have an idea before I start and then with, with the actual writing, um, it goes somewhere else and I'm never sure why. So uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Another question was, did you ever feel like the fiction was so close to a person's life that, that you'd have to ask their permission to use some of those details? Um, that, that is a great idea. I think there are a lot of really, um, there are a lot of questions and ethical questions that I thought a lot about. Um, one of the battles, really running battles I had with the publisher, I did not want to have captions under the photos. And he absolutely insisted. But anyway, I lost that fight. Um, but the reason that I did not want to have ca captions is I was not writing about the people that were in that building. And um, I didn't want to run the risk of people thinking that I was. I made it, I mean, I stated very clearly that it was fiction. Um, and, uh, but I also um, did not, because I couldn't know enough about anyone that was actually living in those houses, what I came up with was not related to who 
were, was actually living in the house at all. So, but I did also did not want people to think that that they did, you know, other than just stating it. <laughs> uh, I, I hated the idea of someone driving by and thinking, oh yeah, I know that story. So um, I was worried about that, but that was one reason why I did. I really didn't want to even locate them, you know, as much as possible. I tried to keep the locations, since I did lose that battle, I tried to keep the locations pretty vague. Um, but uh, I don't think that I have, I, I, I can't think of, I mean, some of the oral histories, I know, um, for instance, uh, waiting at in Leonardtown, there's a, there's a scene where someone's waiting for a bus in Leonardtown in front of, of the Duke building or the drugstore. And I know that that happened um, because I, I read that or in oral histories or I learned it somehow, but I have no idea who that was or how I would even ask permission. And I don't, and it happened to many people. So I never felt that I was close to, to you know, depicting someone's real life. Well, okay, I had a very close friend who maybe I, I based some of the, a little bit of it on an older woman, but I, I know there was absolutely nothing that I was saying where she would be identified or that she would care if she was identified, you know, but there, I mean, because particularly there are some, um, there are some that are not happy stories or not flattering stories. And um, so I particularly did not want to suggest that I knew any of those people or what actually happened in the house. So I know that's the best I can answer that, but as there was definitely something I, I worried about in terms of uh, utilizing the buildings, but th they were all publicly accessible. I mean, you 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 drive by these buildings, you don't really have the privacy of you know saying no one can talk about what's inside this building. But I mean, it's it's a definitely could be a point of contention. So I don't know what if somebody else has some thoughts on that. Oh, well, there was a couple of thoughts on um, some other photography pieces that that you have. For example, in um, the current exhibit here at the at the library, um, uh, you have uh, what was, uh, one person's favorite was the the window view from the slave cabin. Um, that you, because that's that's a window on the world that many people don't get to see and um and one person mentioned that there's a, a that you've done a progression of the um the the big white barn um, um a series of of that particular building did you have any other progressions um in your not I necessarily any, in the book but other yeah i don't have work. any other progressions in the book but yeah i have a lot of well or several you know that are kind of in my neighborhood i mean these are these are buildings in my neighborhood, most of them, but um, yeah, where I've watched them fall down and I keep taking pictures. I mean, it'd be nice to do something with that sometime. Yeah, when I was, the, I, I was going to say, it's interesting that the, the view from the quarters um, leaves it completely open to imagination of what time period and who's looking, but um, that that photo uh, doesn't have a, a story. Well, a couple other things that I thought about when I read the book, um, um, there was a couple of big themes about eras in St. Mary's County history. And so one of those was the tobacco era. Uh, and one of them was, you know, since the Navy base has been built here. So tell us about the effect that you think that those two have had on the history of St. Mary's County. And um, do you think that one or the other has had more of an effect? Um, well, although I, I have done research on St. Mary's County, I would say that I'm, I'm definitely not an economist. And um, so I, you know, I have the same sort of general knowledge uh, 
as, as a lot of people, but obviously the, um, the coming of the base was a, an enormous shift. Um, probably the biggest shift since the coming of the colonists, which was huge, but um, the base uh, changed the economy of, of the county or began to change the economy of the county. And it changed the demographics of the county. Um, uh, it became the, much more diverse. Um, people came in to work at the base, to build the base, uh, and, and to, to work for the Navy. And uh, people came, in fact, from all over the country, from all over the world. And so what had been really a very kind of closed society in a way uh, became a lot more open in a lot of ways, you know, gradually and over time. And it became a much bigger population. So um, it, since the economy then moved away from the agrarian, you know, the water and, and the uh, agriculture and slowly became military, military contractors and technology. So that was just a massive change. And I think that um, when the tobacco buyout, big, big tobacco um, was forced to, um, to fund a buyout and uh, a lot, if not most, of the people still growing tobacco in, uh, and then I think it was the 1990s, but um, stopped growing tobacco and shifted. But at that time, I mean, it was so much later, it was just more of a progression because of the change in, in the economy. Uh, it was a cultural change because even though maybe tobacco wasn't as important in the economy, there was a culture that went along with growing tobacco. And, and so, you know, there have been hundreds of years of growing tobacco in St. Mary's County. And a lot of people were really attached to that, even if they felt, you know, they knew it was not necessarily a healthy thing. Uh, they, they did, um, they loved that culture. And uh, so there was a sense of loss for a lot of people and there are a few farmers that, that uh, held on to it. So I'd say it was uh, more of a cultural change than an economic change, but it became a part of that whole shift to a very different kind of, of county, depending on a different kind of economy. For sure. Um, I, I'm a relative newcomer to St. Mary's County, only 20 years. And, um, and so I remember some of those shifts, you know, as they were taking place. So thank you for, thank you for expounding on that a bit. Um, well, I noticed particularly the growth in, in the number of people has meant a tremendous right, sure. growth, in, uh, not growth, a change in, uh, envir in the environment. I mean, this was one of the most unspoiled, undeveloped peninsulas on the East Coast. And it now, you know, is um, almost, you know, suburban and it's no longer that rural um, agricultural kind of place. It's slipping away from that. So um, in, in terms of what it's done for the environment, um, you know, it's, it's a very big and not necessarily very great change. <laughs> So I know you didn't necessarily want to put locations or places on um, on the photographs, uh, but I did notice that a number of the photographs were in Beachville, and it seems like people may have moved out of that area. Do you have any history of like that specific space here in St. Mary's County? Yeah, I'm glad that you asked that. Which so this is this is where the real history and and my photos don't necessarily jive very well. But Beachville has a very interesting history because um, uh, apparently uh, it, it was a very early African-American town. Um, and uh, according to, uh, there's a couple of books that mention it. Uh, what, there's a wonderful book called uh, Hearth and Home by George McDaniel. It's about material culture. And it's, a, it's just a, a wonderful book. And he talks a bit about Beachville. And Kurt Renzetta uh, has a, a book on architecture in St. Mary's County called Going Down County, I think. And he mentions it, but he also mentions George McDaniels. McDaniels so I think that was part of his source. But 
Um, apparently, uh, people, uh, a group came up from um, Virginia, according to what they're saying, and bought land right after the Civil War. So in the, in the 1880s and 90s, no later than the 1890s, it was settled and it became, it was also called gum, land, gum landing. And um, it, um, um, I think there was the first man that bought uh, land there uh, was uh, Richard Medley. And um, also families that settled it were um, the Carrolls and the um, 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 Butlers. And and um, I know Milburns, and, and they're still so. I don't think they've. I think the ancestors, descendants, there's still some people there. Um, I think I know Milburns are there, and I believe some Butlers are there, and actually maybe some people that are on uh, that are here today would uh, know more about that. But that that's a really. I wish there that I knew more history about that. So um, that's that's the real history, <laughs> and I knew some of it, <clears throat> but uh, uh, yeah. I, anybody that wants to, to that knows more about it, <clears throat> yes, we great. we yeah, did we, we had, had a comment about um, interviews and oral histories that yeah, on, on were collected about Beachville. Yeah. So, um, but that it's a. The houses, I mean, I just felt a connection in going through there, the, the houses that do remain. And I do have a lot of, actually, there are two photos of the same house. I think they just look really different in that. And I thought, well, that's true, you know, that you don't have the same people living in a house for 100 years. So <laughs> that one family comes in and one family goes out. And uh, so two stories with the same house makes perfect sense. But um, that uh, those houses are, are special to me. And one of them you know, has a lot of wisteria growing on it, which I just love. So that's partly, this looks very romantic. It may not, they may not have had very romantic lives. <laughs> but, uh, but now it looks, now it looks like it, yes. Yeah, but I do go by there every once in a while to take more photos. So are there places that you wish you could have included in this book, maybe? Anything that might be in an upcoming project? Um, I have an upcoming project, but as far as whether this book, um, I, I tried to really create the history of a community. That was the, the idea. And there is, I mean, people that don't know the book, but there is a kind of historic uh, arc to it. And you wouldn't get that from the slideshow, but in my mind, it's not <clears throat> laid out with dates, but it starts um, in the 19th century, early maybe, and then um, and then brings it through time, just gradually suggested by the music or the stamps or the hairstyles or whatever, and then development. It moves up into about 1990, so it has kind of a historical arc, but. Uh, and it, I think it's it's a pretty, so I tried to reflect at least some of the diversity of the community and different ages and, and gender and everything, all kinds of diversity. But um, it is by, it certainly leaves a lot of, of probably cultural groups out. And uh, one of them is the Amish or Mennonites. And that was for two reasons. Uh, they. Uh, really are not, they're not keen on being photographed in general, as I understand it. And I didn't feel that I knew them enough or knew, knew of them enough. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I wasn't able to include them, whether, I mean, I know that's something that's very characteristic of St. Mary's County that, that is missing. But um, otherwise, I think it's, I, it's hard to say what I, I I was led by what was there to photograph. Um, that makes sense. Oh. Um, I was going to ask um, to that um, there was a request to share the story that um, that you've told about your dad's church in Arkansas, um, oh. and so that's oh. a little bit about your social justice work. Can you can you tell us that story? 
Um, well, let's see, I have to do a very brief, <laughs> do we have time? Very brief um, <clears throat> summary. Um, yeah, so I was too young to really know what was going on at the time of this story. So, um, uh, but my father got a call that his brother had, uh, we lived in Colorado, and he got a call that his brother um, had, emphys had emphysema and was in the hospital. He was very ill and he was unable to um, keep his business going. And he asked uh, my father to come and, um, and help take over the business for while he was ill. And um, so uh, my father very much rejected his Southern roots in Arkansas. <laughs> so, but he did not, he wanted to go help his, his father. So we all got, as I remember, I think we were on a, like a trailways bus or something, we, you know, and we went down to Arkansas and um, we stayed there. Uh, I was four, so we're, we're talking a very long time ago. <laughs> But uh, I was less than four. No, it was 18 months when we went. That's right. So um, the, uh, <clears throat> my father was, had very radical ideas in, in relationship to, to his brother. And um, it's a small Arkansas town, McGee, Arkansas, and um, very traditional. And my parents got into trouble pretty much right away. Uh, my mother was a teacher and, um, from Illinois and definitely a Yankee. And uh, she, um, she was very upset by the fact that they would pack up all the used and, and torn up books when they were done with them from the school and pack them up and send them to the colored schools, you know? And, um, and then they, um, <clears throat> we had a, a, a black um, a worker, a housekeeper, and I think she also, Care, did child care. And um, one day my aunt um, called my parents in and said that they were ruining the economy at McGee because they were paying their help too much. And um, that was the first time I think they had a real run in. So uh, then um, what the, the, I guess we were there a few years and my parents, um, put an ad into the local paper advertising the first humanist church of McGee, Arkansas would be held in their home and they would be opening it up to um, people of, of all creed, color, and belief. And um, that, and that we would be holding the first meeting in our home on Sunday. And the next thing that happened was that two men uh, knocked on the door and my mother opened it. My brother, who's a couple years older, was kind of hiding behind her skirts and looking out. And um, the two men were, had shotguns and they said that um, if any uh, N-word uh, showed their head, on the block come Sunday, they would be there to blow it off, basically. And, um, and they pointed at my brother, this is what I'm told, he remembers it. And they pointed at my brother and said, you better keep him inside too. And um, so the, the threat was, was clear, apparently. And um, unfortunately, you know, I think my parents were, were very um, unrealistic and maybe they, uh, they just wanted, I don't know if they really expected to be able to make that kind of huge change in, in the culture there, <laughs> um, but they wanted to, they wanted to. And um, so what happened following that very rapidly is that all of the people, my, my uncle's business was, um, servicing all the vending machines in, in the little country stores all around the area. And um, all of his um, people that, were, that uh, all the store owners uh, immediately ended his contract. And um, so <laughs> my parents pretty quickly packed up and 
took us off and back uh, north. And I think that my uncle was able to, um, to you know, blame it all on his crazy uh, brother and radical brother and got his business back as far as I know. But uh, there was a breach in the family <laughs> relationship from that point on. And uh, so um, that's just really kind of, you know, rushing it all together. But that was the end of our stay in, in Arkansas. And um, my, my father had a, a real, you know, he, he thought he had a very, he has a seminary training and he had it all written out what he wanted to do and he was very idealistic. So that was my Arkansas story and, uh, and I'm sticking to it, no, <laughs> my Arkansas story. And that was definitely my, my family, my parents were very um, progressive and you know, they, they were, they belonged to SANE, which is an anti-nuclear group. They were socialists. They were uh, very, very leftists. I say that's a a powerful story. Uh, tell us about some of the other powerful stories that you've collected doing oral history, uh, because it, people get to share their personal experiences like that. What are some of the ones that that stand out to you? Oh, there's so many. Um, actually, I was thinking of um, going back to the the idea of. Uh, whether uh, there was any, did I ever feel like the story was too close to the reality? Um, and actually, I, I was partly, it was the, the generosity of my friends in sharing their stories because one of the stories um, was about uh, doing uh, African-American hair. And I actually have an image, but I don't know if we can pull it up, but there's an image in the, um, in the exhibit of a, a little stove and for heating the, the comb. And, um, and Alma, uh, Jordan and, and Joyce, I don't know who else is, and Teresa's on here. They, <laughs> this was their mother's uh, stove. And we were, uh, and Brenda, I think so too. And I asked them to tell me about doing hair and uh, about their family story. And we were going up to, to Leonardtown. I was in the back seat, I think, when, and they told me, and I just took notes. So that story is actually their story. And I would say that since they gave it to me, I was using it with permission. But um, that, you know, that was to me a really wonderful, I've gotten a lot of wonderful stories. It's hard to say um, what in particular stands out I mean they're just it's uh, I guess one thing in general they're more like the fact that the similarities and differences um, so we have UCAC has um, been interviewing mostly African Americans in fact all African Americans I think and um, so a lot of them old timers will talk, I know that they had lives where they maybe had very little uh, income, not all of them, you know, but some of them. And, um, and life on the farm, well, going to a one room school and especially during segregation and walking barefoot to school. I mean, I was shocked actually at that, with the idea that um, maybe that they walked to school barefoot. I hadn't really thought of that. Um, and that they may have sometimes not had enough to eat. The teachers um, help, you know, bring food, make food. So, I mean, it was, but that was not just African-Americans. I mean, it was sometimes poor, a lot of um, uh, low income in, in the county, in an agricultural. They usually had enough to eat because so many of them had farms. But, um, but so you would hear sometimes, in other words, some hardship, you would hear about hardship, you would hear about racism, um, if we asked them, maybe, but uh, they would almost invariably end up saying, it was a great life. <laughs> so that to me was overall something really important that, that I learned was in looking back, and maybe it's because they were the kind of people they were, 
uh, religion was very important to most of them. Um, but that no matter what happened in, in their life, at the end of their life, when they would be summing it up, most people would say, oh, yeah, it was, a, it was a good life. It was a good life. So, and maybe as I, as I get older, I'm beginning to <laughs> understand that better. But um, uh, I don't know any particular ones that stand out. Uh, but there are other people that are, have been doing, uh, that are here today that have been doing those interviews. So maybe they would have more to say. Um, I, uh, we have interviewed the, the uh, former students of Drayden School. And Drain School is an African American one room school. Um, it was built around 1890 and uh, it operated until uh, in the 1940s. And um, we actually have interviewed students who are still alive, some of them, um, who uh, went as students to, uh, to Drain School. And that's pretty special <laughs> to be able to have. You know, here they are, and they're they're still, uh, you know, they, they went to school there, and then in the eighteen uh, forties, and I mean 1940s, 1940s and thirties even, and um, so uh, I guess the lesson there is that you know it wasn't a long a lot of things that we think were a long time ago, they really weren't a long time ago, you know, they really, so. Um, uh, I, I love hearing about the, the education, the stories uh, of, of the one room schools. Um, I, there were also some, um, some, we did learn about, there were issues of, of, of discrimination. Um, actually in doing, one of the most interesting projects I've done is uh, the, the documentary on Great Mills High School desegregation. And um, I did the interviews for that. And uh, Mr. Newkirk, Theodore Newkirk, was um, very um, uh, active in the, the NAACP and in that uh, fight to integrate the schools. And um, also inter interviewed uh, Joan Groves Briscoe, who um, was the first African-American student at Great Mills High School and her family sued to, uh, to desegregate the school for her and her brother. So that was also really um, special. And uh, so I, I love doing those interviews and, and doing that documentary um, with David Taylor, Focus Video. So, um, they're all special. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to choose. Yeah, it's hard to choose. And, and the other thing I learned in general is that people enjoy sharing their stories, that, that it, it benefits both parties, the person listening and, and sort of collecting all of, that, all of that information to pass on to others to know, you know, what was it like? What was it like for you? And uh, what was it like then? And then, um, but the person telling the story, I think invariably feels like they got something important out of it as well. That's, a, that's amazing. Tell us about other projects that you're working on or okay. are you working on another book yes, or something I, else artistic? Yes, and Faye, I think Faye has um, some images from my forthcoming book. Um, I am working on um, a book that's going to come out next year, uh, and it is um, about, this is a, a further leap out on a limb, I would say, it is a book about the everyday lives of people who are enslaved in tobacco plantations in Southern Maryland, uh, like Sodderly Plantation, not just Sodderly but also the Jesuit plantations. And um, so once again, I'm taking um, real history and um, taking, uh, I hope, a forgivable leap of imagination because there are so many stories that are lost and cannot be found. This is a very different project than people who are working on genealogy and DNA, which in archeology span is dig literally digging up uh, real artifacts, 
But um, the truth is that for hundreds or maybe thousands of, of people who who had this experience of being enslaved and, and working as uh, an enslaved laborer, their stories are just not reachable. They've, they've been lost. And I really wanted to, um, to bring something of truth to it and, and to, um, to honor their experiences. And uh, the book is called Making a Way Out of No Way, Lives of Labor, Love, and Resistance. And um, this too was inspired somewhat by, um, by Agnes Kane Callum. I interviewed, I had the honor to interview Agnes Kane Callum. So maybe there's a highlight as far as interviews. But um, Agnes Kane Callum was uh, an incredible historian, genealogist, um, whose ancestors were enslaved at Sodderley Plantation. And she has shared her oral histories in, in, and they've been published and she shared them with Sodderley. Um, this is just a date out of the garden at Sodderley. And in the story, which I'm not gonna read, um, the woman is, um, is working on, is weeding the garden on this side of the wall. And she overhears the master and, and a friend talking on the other side of the wall, wall and she gets some very important information about um, the war, the Brits <laughs> coming. And uh, so, and then they go into the house and she runs through the gate and down to the quarters to, to share what she's learned. Um, so we could, uh, Faye, if we could look at uh, another photo. There we go. Okay, there's five That's of lovely. them. They're just five of them. These are in the exhibit at, at the library. And um, I have prints of them. So, and this one was about a young man who'd, who'd, um, who'd gotten into trouble and ran and uh, is hiding in the marsh. And he's, he's uh, tortured by the the decision of whether to, to go back and face the punishment, but also have the comfort of, of his family or to try to run. So um, this is actually the marsh that's outside of my house um, and down and outside my house. So when I took the photo, I wasn't even thinking about this um, book, I think, but so he's hiding in the marsh. And um, the next photo. I also want to mention that I am very much indebted to my readers who have uh, who pre previewed these, and some of the readers uh, and uh, are, are are here today, and I thank them profusely, and um, will probably ask more of them. And also, um, two of my best friends. Uh, were really helped me with the editing, um, Faith Potts and Jackie Pascal, and I think they're here. But um, it was so great to have descend actually this descendants, including uh, Jan Briscoe, who's a descendant of one of the Sodderly owners. I've had uh, a number of descendants read, um, preview this, and they have all been wonderfully positive in their responses because I, I really felt like I couldn't go forward without you know, getting the, the blessing, so to speak, of, of the descendants of people that I'm writing about. Um, so this uh, was a wonderful experience for me because uh, this was a um, Mennonite or, uh, or Amish, I think he's Mennonite, uh, farmer, tobacco farmer. And one of the people who is <laughs> growing tobacco and uh, he gave me permission to come on to his uh, farm and I got some great photos of his tobacco, his tobacco barn. And um, so uh, this, that, that was just a wonderful experience to get, to get the photos. I had, I had several of those. Um, I, I photographed a, a, an old loom and uh, Mr. Richards uh, at the St. Mary's County Fairgrounds opened up the museum up, the farm museum up there so that I could photograph that loom. And um, Sue Sloan let me uh, a shuttle, an old shuttle to photograph. So 
sort of the, the, the treasure hunt of finding photos was, was really quite uh, enjoyable. And in this case, the stories preceded the photographs. The photographs in this case work more like uh, illustrations for this, the, um, the stories. But um, I think uh, this one has to do with um, taking in the crop of tobacco. And there, there are a number of stories that feature um, the, the work on the tobacco, um, but also some of the ways, uh, you, you know, one of the big focuses of this book is um, a result of the, my primary question, which was, how did they survive? When I interviewed Agnes Kane Callum, and I asked her sort of after we had talked about all these, these accomplishments of her ancestors and um, what it was like. And I said, well, if you, if you just had, you know, a few minutes to talk to people at, who were visiting Sauterly about, um, about your ancestors and about this history, uh, what would you say? And she said, uh, I would say they, they survived. And I just was so taken aback because I had thought of, I had not thought of survival. I mean, obviously if they hadn't survived, she wouldn't be here, but that was not the point. I think the point was to me, they were able to surmount this astounding obstacles and treatment, the, the treatment of being, you know, as if they were not fully human. And they, they were able to survive. So my pursuit with the book was to follow that question, how did they survive? You know, what sort of strategies, what sort of, of cultural uh, gifts, what sort of strengths um, and abilities, um, you know, al allowed them to, to survive and not only survive, but, but thrive in many ways from, for many of them, not certainly all. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, let's go to the, the next photograph. Um, yeah, most of the, the uh, photographs are of work. Um, the, their lives were lives of labor. And I think, you know, a lot of writing about slavery focuses on, uh, for good reason, people who escape or on atrocities. And um, what I wanted to do was not to focus on the most graphic um, horrors, although, I mean, there's tremendous amount of pain uh, in the stories, but, but nothing, um, you know, not, not to focus on violence and um, although there is some, but uh, to really try to think about what about for most people, for most of them, you know, their everyday lives were just labor, unending, backbreaking, you know, unceasing labor. And um, so I wanted to think about how they dealt with that, you know, what got them through. And so a lot of the photos are actually of tools. And um, this one is a very um, a difficult story, which so I'm not going to go into it. But <laughs> uh, I I I found that there was you know just just as as with the buildings and with listening in the buildings that were falling down and decaying, there was often to me a a, a little a kind of beauty that um, that was there in spite of it, and. I think the same thing with with the tools, and I'm sure that one of the ways that they survived was by finding beauty, um, finding joy in in some way, often through their families, um, and not not so much through the work, but through their families, or but sometimes even honestly, you know, being very proud of of their work. Um, so uh, you'll have to read this one. <laughs> and uh, let's look at the next photo. So, um, well, I think you can figure out what, what this one is. And the story is about a blacksmith. And when you imagine, 
that uh, an enslaved blacksmith was often required to work on things like shackles and um, the tools of, of imprisonment, basically. So uh, I was imagining that uh, extraordinary kind of situation. And I believe that this, this one actually, um, you know, a lot of them end up with their, one of the things that I think uh, was a form of resistance was maybe a fantasy, but a fantasy of, of revenge possibly uh, must, must have occasionally occurred to them. But um, anyway, this is, this is the kind of a uh, little bit beat up uh, uh, black, blacksmith station at Sodderly. And um, these, uh, the, these are not, these are reproduction shackles, uh, but they are in the Sodderly collection in the exhibit that is in the corn crib, which I hope you will all take in. If you haven't seen the exhibit in the corn crib, it's all about the uh, 300 years of workers at, uh, uh, at Sodderly. And uh, the majority are actually African-Americans because it starts with, uh, you know, through slavery through uh, the, into the 20th century and a lot of the uh, employed help uh, after slavery times were African-American. And um, so uh, that's, these are shackles, part of the story. Um, uh, one of our one of our um, our um, attendees mentions that you were the project director for our land the land lives and labor exhibit over at Sodderly. I was I was yeah advertising it, <laughs> but I yes, um, Jeannie Pertle and I uh, shared the the creation of of that. Um, oh good, here's another one. This is <laughs> back to this in. but. Um, um, so we can just hold that on. That's fine. Uh, yeah, that was, a, I learned so much. And that's actually was another reason I, I did the book, the, the, the new book, is because I gained so much uh, information. Because in that case, uh, that not so much oral history, but, um, you know, really just scholarly uh, uh, studies, reading scholarly studies, reading um, more history uh, about the area and in particular slavery in that area, but also um, post-Civil War. And so Jeannie Pirtle and I worked together and uh, Dennis Cohn was the um, designer and a lot of Southerly people were involved in that. And um, I think it's a, it's the, was the first Southerly's first um, permanent exhibit and it, it is it has it is packed with information, probably too packed in a small space, but it is rich and dense with information. So I, I hope that if you haven't seen it and you have a chance to go to Sodderly, you will look at that. There's there's an exhibit in the the uh, slave cabin, but there's also this exhibit, Land Lives and Labor, is in the Corn Crib building. So this this uh. <laughs> really uh, goes along with the bootleg story. Uh, and I, I was thinking, I was just, this came up because I sent in some more uh, images in case we needed, we ran out of anything to talk about and ran out of images and more images. In the exhibit, um, we shared uh, uh, how many, uh, I think 12 or uh, 11 photographs from listening in. This is not one of them, so you get to see it now. But uh, 11 photographs from listening in. And actually with every story and listening in, there are really two photographs. There's a larger photograph and there's a little thumbnail kind of photograph. So there's two photographs per every story. And this is a thumbnail um, in the bootleg story about the revenuers that I already <laughs> read. Um, but, uh, I, I couldn't resist the, the story because there's bullet holes there in the boat. It has, you know, it's just a boat that Bob and I uh, found. But anyway, um, Faye, do you have more photos you want to show? 
are there more in that we could just look at are we how are we doing say the oh. um the, the bullet holes make make that story <laughs> very very real they didn't um, keep it tamped down <laughs> right exactly that that lends a lot of credence to the uh the, the bootlegging oh, uh story yeah. i just threw this in because there are businesses in um there are photographs and stories of businesses in St. Mary's County. This one's gone. I don't know if people might remember it. It was on uh, Great Mills Road. And um, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, I, the story is goes back to early days of someone opening up the, the shop, you know, and all the early I, I had so much fun doing the research and it's kind of a quick and dirty kind of research. It's very easy, you know, thanks to the internet, but getting these models of, of televisions and radios when, when you know, when they were um, popular, what, what they might've sold there. And he was kind of a mis Mr. Fix-It. So um, it, it is in the book. Is there another uh, photo there? I think there's a, a barn. Another. Well, and, and one person comments that, um, you know, the, the county probably uh, tore that one down with public grant monies, I think, when it was really rather um, shabby and <laughs> yeah, falling apart. Okay, this would just be another far, another barn, sorry. And this is actually the same barn um, as the one that we uh, saw with the tobacco story about the mother and the two daughters and the tobacco. Um, this one, I, I would, I do have a photo of what it looks like now and it is very sad. I don't have the photo ready to pull up, but this is at the corner of um, uh, Willows Road and uh, five, Route five. So this is, is just down the way from me. I live very close to this and it was just a foggy day and this barn um, was a tobacco barn. It is the same barn as in the other photos. Yeah, it is a boss helping out here. 75% collapsed. Um, it's still there though, at the corner of Willis Road and Route 5. And um, it turns out there was a car in there. I don't, I don't know if that's still there or that's gone, but it's, it's pretty much completely collapsed. And it is now not attractive in any way, shape, or form to photograph, you know, but I did photograph it as, as it's in its more current condition. But I, I just like the foggy barn and it, it, that doesn't have its own uh, story. It's, it's um, in the book, but it's just as a sort of frontispiece. Also, I want to mention, you know, there is a, a poem uh, by Lucille Clifton in, um, in Listening In, about mulberry tree fields, mul mulberry fields, sorry, <laughs> mulberry fields, and it's about the cemetery, and um, it's a wonderful poem, and I'm really grateful to her daughters, uh, who now are, uh, have the estate, the trust, and for letting me use that, and there's going to be um, a poem of hers in the coming book as well, the poem called Slave Ships. Um, and uh, also my wonderful introduction uh, by Jeff Hammond, I was, I was very grateful for in listening in. I mean, it's just a wonderful introduction. I don't know if anybody knows the poet Ethelbert Miller, but he is, has written a preface for um, the forthcoming book. And, um, and Rex Ellis has written an introduction as well. So i um, very excited about that. Um, there, there were some other photos, but I don't think uh, that, uh, I don't know if they can pull them up. I think but. that that was um, probably one of the last ones that we had. Um, but yeah, when I, is the I new book? I, I'm sorry. I guess I sent them in links. I don't know. But I mean, I know I had one of um, Alma, Teresa, Joyce, and Brenda's mother's uh, little stove. But... <laughs> They, they should tell that story. Um, and that photograph is in the exhibit with the story. Okay, I'm sorry, you were saying? No, no, no. I, when, is the, when is the new book expected to hit the shelves? Well, 
Unfortunately, not not because of me. I mean, it's been. I mean, to me, it's it's really really been basically done for a long time. But um, it is going to be published by the same publisher, George Thompson, and it took um, a, a, a bottom. It said a long list of books that they have coming up, and so they've told me it's now not going to come out until next spring. So. Um, I will just have to be patient, and uh, and uh, I'm sure at this point in my life, anyway, time is flying by. So um, we hope we, I mean, we hope that they're still able to publish the book, and the economy is not completely collapsed. Poor Ukraine, poor us, poor world. So in these perilous times, it is supposed to come out next spring. Well, we will all hope so. Um, I'm, I know that the library will want a copy and we will, we'll have to have you come back and tell us some more of the stories. Um, that, that's amazing. We'll, we'll get another local book of stories. Thank so thank you. you all. Thank you so much for um, bringing these stories to us, um, bringing these photographs of a vanishing St. Mary's County. And um, thank you to all of our, um, our wonderful commenters and attendees today. You've really made this a, a very rich experience. Um, so thank you. Just many, many thanks to Meredith for, for being here today.